Welcome to Planet Geo, the podcast where we talk about our amazing planet, how it works, and why it matters to you. I'm recording. So am I. Got to get my mic right up nice and tight to this beaver I have laying across my mouth. <laughs> it's a very old beaver, it's a, though. It's, he's all gray. It's not like it's a, a nice normal pelt beaver. You got there. <laughs> Chris has a mouth pelt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is yeah, that's that's it. That's what it is. Oh, that's oh, so good. Goodness. Oh man. Uh, uh, well, you know, gonna, Jesse, like I said to you earlier, I have hair envy, and the only thing I can do, I really do want to do that. I want to braid it and put some beads in it. And Jenny, <laughs> she thinks I is look. Jenny naughty on board with this? I do that. Oh, for sure. She got mad at me when I cut it off last time. Yeah. Here's the here's the problem. Here's the let me let me tell you, Chris. What I think the problem is with the Bullheis household is there's no there's nobody <laughs> reining you two in. The both of you are just in like a competition to be more ridiculous with one another all the time. And there's nobody like being like, no, 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 Bullheises. <laughs> there's like societal norms here that we have to like you know Wait a adhere second. to. You're both just nuts. Uh, there are so many questions I have about this <laughs> statement here. First of all. What else besides the fact that I want to grow? So I am growing my goatee out <laughs> and I want to braid it and I'm going to put beads in it. Okay. And yeah. what oh, is it about okay, yeah. that that is so out of the norm of reality? Like, tell me about that a second. <laughs> Chris Boys. Chris Boys <laughs> with what? a gray <laughs> goatee <laughs> beard with beads in it is not. This is not like the picture of you as a person I have in my head. You know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. What it kind of picture fit. do you have of me? I Look, I'm a... A, I'm a big, uh, cuddly teddy bear. I am not a big, cuddly teddy bear. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. Wise. I guess I, I can be. I can be that. Yeah. You can be. Hey, yeah. Jesse, you can't put me in a box. Don't try. Don't try. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Fair enough. Don't fair put enough. me in a box. I'm not... I guess I'm not your normal teacher profile am i uh you're not i have normal. a sleeve of right. tattoos i'll agree with you you're not normal <laughs> i have a sleeve of tattoos it's true. i have a very long goatee i'm bald big veins sticking out his forehead forgets stuff all the time falls asleep uh, way too early in the night yep. <laughs> <Massive> <laughs> just stunningly good looking i mean yes. you know <laughs> classic good looks so I mean, all right, you what got... about now all right on to the next one you never answered my question though what was the question? What else is it about me that, that is just so out of the norm here? I don't know if it's so much you as your wife, actually. You okay, know? well, let's talk about that then. Let's in. switch no. gears. The, what about Jenny needs to be reined in? And nobody says, like, hey, bullheises, <laughs> rein it in a little bit, you know? <laughs> no, nobody does. <laughs> nobody says that to you ever. And, and we're not, certainly not going to say it to each other. No, exactly. <laughs> there's no parents around. There, there's no sibling. Nobody's telling, no bartenders telling you to rein it in. Like, you know, you just need somebody nope, in your life we got that nothing. says, hey, wrap it up a little bit. Tighten it up, boys. <laughs> I could not disagree with you more. I think actually living in our household is actually freaking a riot. It's a, it's, it's, it's a fun. chaotic environment over there. It's a, it's good until about <laughs> seven thirty PM. We'll, at what time Chris falls asleep and then it's all good. I do so. get tired. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. my nine year old self, I couldn't wait to, to be older so that I could go to bed whenever I wanted. And now I'm older and I want to go to bed at nine o'clock. <laughs> <sighs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Wow. Okay. Well, that was a big, long ramble oh, about, uh, about the bull house household. <laughs> Me too. That was funny. Well, Chris, I think we're in a good mood because we just had a, a fantastic interview with Dr. Steph Borzak, who is a, a PhD economic geologist, a SCARN expert, is now the senior project geologist at Donlin Gold, which is a, a gold deposit company up in Alaska. And she has a, a gold mine, if you'll excuse the pun, of knowledge about economic geology. That was good, right? Give me some creds for that one, right? No. 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 Okay. Really well, she right, she's a, <laughs> a very valuable resource. Let's put it that way. Do you agree with that part? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. I mean, super interesting insights into like everything. Exactly. And I just want to say that at the end of the interview was a question that we asked her that I think was a, it's just an excellent answer. And it deals with being a geologist and the dirty business of mining and the potential conflict with that. Her answer to that was, 
refreshing and very insightful, I thought as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, you know, the statement that I don't struggle with that. You know, we need this stuff out of the ground. We need to do it well. We can do it well. I mean, it's just a beautiful answer. Really, really well-spoken, top flight geologist. And I mean, has worked on some very cool rocks as well. I was loving her descriptions of the scarn deposits she's worked on over her career. Uh, just totally, totally cool stuff. It, and I thought from the, you know, you and I, Chris, interact with students all the time. And I thought some of her advice was really valuable for both active students and people considering going back and getting degrees. I, I thought that was a, a very refreshing take. So I learned a lot um, from this conversation with Steph and I, I look forward to talking to her more. Agree, 100%. Hey, with that, Steph Morozek coming your way. Okay. Well, Dr. Steph Morozek, welcome to Planet Geo, and thanks for joining us. We're uh, excited to have you here and talk about oh, economic geology. This is very exciting. So welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be invited. Is, well, this is great. I, I, I'm excited to talk. We have a, a little bit of a research collaboration going on, uh, which is exciting. So we've talked recently in the last couple of weeks. We'll actually probably talk tomorrow, it seems like, too. Uh, but this is Planet Geo. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's wait, get into wait it, a Chris. Minute. Wait a minute. When, what's this research collaboration thing? Can you talk about that or not? Yeah, I think so. There's an undergrad who's yeah. working in, in our lab here that Steph is, is that's working on samples Steph has sent, and we're collaborating on okay. you know some technique development oh, right. on the, the gold mine donlin gold that stuff's um right. are you, working on at the moment are you dating something then jesse yeah we're trying to date the well we're trying to date mineralization i don't know steph jump in here you know the deposit better than well, i do but i know the deposit but you guys know what you're doing with the dating yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> i just provided the samples <laughs> technique development let's put it that way <laughs> yeah so okay yeah. all right interesting yeah, we're, we're trying that. something new right. yeah that's right and to, okay uh, yeah new for donlin and new for, uh, well, it's not really new for you guys, is it? You guys have been working on this technique for a little well, while, but we're yeah, testing the, it out on some The technique is, uh, we've been working on it for a little while, but application to economic geology is very new and exciting. So it's exciting to, to be working on economic geology problems. Yeah, for sure. I feel like we're being pretty cryptic, but we could we could probably talk more about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe Another, maybe we'll later on. we'll drag this out later on. Maybe right. <laughs> perfect. That perfect. sound yeah. good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, then with that stuff, let's go ahead and jump into our traditional first question. We always start off by asking Jesse and I each have stories about how and why we got into geoscience. What's your story? You know, what happened? What led you in this direction? Well, I think I could blame my parents because we traveled a fair bit when I was growing up. So I, I'll just say I grew up, this story is a little bit about geography and it's and it eventually ends with geology. <laughs> Perfect. Um, geography, family, and geology. So yeah, so I grew up in Toronto, Canada. And uh, my dad is from Western Pennsylvania. My mom is from about four or five hours north of Toronto on what we call the Canadian Shield. And um, yes. so home, home <laughs> that's Jesse's, <laughs> Jesse's wheelhouse there. <laughs> so growing up in Toronto, we were kind of in the middle of these two places and we would always go visit family in these two places. Well, on the farm in Pennsylvania, one of my earliest memories of walking through the fields is that there are these big rocks that are just sitting in the field. It turns out that those are glacial erratics and those rocks have a really different composition from the local rocks, which are like sedimentary, there's coal beds there. And so these were very different looking rocks. That's one thing I knew when I was young. And then going up to where my mom is from, the Canadian Shield, you could see that those rocks looked quite similar to the ones that we saw down in Pennsylvania. And oh, yeah. my young mind was just putting these pieces of this puzzle together. Um, I also did spend, I'll add one more place here, because we would go to Cape Cod every summer for vacation and when you're young you're you're a lot closer to the ground and i spent a lot of time <laughs> uh, looking at sand grains on the beach that's Ooh, true I love and sand. wondering <laughs> sand sand is the best right it is and so awesome th- yeah and i know i heard your guys uh, your episode on the sand lab and i was like that's me you know that's this is i i have sand from everywhere i go because it tells such a great story and so like as a kid you're looking at the sand and figuring out where all these minerals came from. Well, it turns out these erratics on the farm in Pennsylvania and the sand that I was looking at on Cape Cod, all of this stuff kind of ties back to pretty much where my mom is from 
all of this material has been moved down from that part of the continent. And so like, it's such a fascinating way to, to put this little puzzle of the earth together in this part of the world. Well, you know, I always was fascinated with these things, but it probably wasn't until like high school when I was looking through some textbooks. My dad is a doctor and I was looking through his old textbooks. He had a geology textbook. It was on the bottom shelf. And I pulled that thing out and I was like, this is a lot of interesting stuff. Well, I asked him about it and he said that he took a geology class in college. And that was a moment when I, when it clicked, I just was like, I didn't know you could take a geology class in college. So you mean I could become a geologist? <laughs> you mean I could study this? <laughs> and it turns out you yeah, can. Yeah, so yeah. I knew at that moment that I was going to do this. I guess I didn't know specifically what I would end up doing. But I, I went to my guidance counselors, and they didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah, of we course. were not we were not taught geology in high school. The closest thing was a physical geography class, which only touched upon some of the concepts very briefly. And so, I don't think they knew what to do with a kid who was so convinced about what they wanted to do and study a subject that they'd never heard of. <laughs> I mean, that's really surprising in Canada. I mean, it, you know, it makes sense in parts of the U.S. where it's just such Canada is such a resource driven economy and there's so many geologists. I, my experience when I moved to Alberta, which is obviously a very geology centric environment, but was that you just say, oh, I'm a geologist and people were just like, oh, okay, cool. And then next subject, like it wasn't even a, it wasn't weird. Whereas, you know, most of the time growing up in Michigan, as Chris likes to say, they look at you like you got horns growing out of your head when you say you look at rocks and, um, yeah, that's absolutely. So stuff, I have a, a few comments and maybe some questions about what you said. First of all, I am amazed that you recognized rocks in Western Pennsylvania as a young kid that they came from the Canadian shield. I love my kids that I have. I, I do love them, but they would not recognize that. There's no way in but, hell they would recognize yeah. that. No. Um, so that's really impressive, first of all. And yeah, Jesse, like you said too, we've had this talk a lot, Jesse, where you went to Canada and you felt for the first time that you were kind of home, you know, like people knew what a geologist does. So that's kind of surprising that that wasn't your experience. I mean, I do love Canadians as well, but (laughs) yeah, home was the geology aspect to it. So yeah, that's interesting stuff. Uh, Yeah. So did you know, then you, did you start university or college knowing you wanted to go into geology or were you still kind of like just dipping your toes in the water or were you kind of like full bore? I'm getting a geology degree as an undergrad. I entered uh, with my major declared. Wow. Wow. Cool. That's rare. I did too, but it's a rare phenomenon to have people uh, do that. And also yeah. the people um, at the administrative offices were, were like, are you sure? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know exactly. I've already been through this. Nobody knows what I'm talking yeah, yeah. about. I'm pretty sure this is what I want to do. <laughs> that is so a well-practiced argument there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesse, we just had parent-teacher conferences and I have some students that are in, you know, juniors and seniors that want to go into geology and their parents sat across from me and they were concerned. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> what are you, what what are you have doing? Have you done to my kid? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So That's I had to so explain funny. to him, no, this is this is okay. It's actually, this is yeah. a good thing that your your yeah. kid wants yeah, to yeah, go yeah, in yeah. this direction, yeah. <laughs> you know? So uh, maybe I could touch on that then, uh, then uh, Steph, because you graduated with a, a degree and then like, what did you do? Because I know from looking at your resume, your CV and LinkedIn, that you kind of went back for a PhD. You didn't just go straight into the PhD. And I think... I'm curious your take on that. Like, what was that path for you? What was your decision process? Because we have a lot of people who are, who listen to this who struggle with that decision. Like, do I go back for another degree? Do I go back to pursue something I wanted to or not? Like, what was that decision process? What led you to our now, I guess? When I started off knowing that I wanted to become a geologist and, and declaring my major uh, my, for my bachelor's, I didn't know then that I wanted to go on for a PhD. I wasn't convinced that that was the right thing for me. It just, it seems like... You know, four years of a bachelor's degree already sounds like a lot of work. So we'll just see how we feel after that, right? Yeah, right. So I got through the bachelor's and I worked for a while. As a, a job. Uh, Once a while. Well, okay, yeah. So I, I finished my bachelor's and then I worked for about three years in economic geology. I worked in metallurgy uh, at a gold mine and then I ended up working as a mine geologist at that same gold mine. And so I sort of split those three years in those two fields at the same location. And that's when I think that really shaped what I wanted to do with my career. I should just say that when I graduated with my bachelor's, I wanted to go into volcanology. And I did dabble in volcanology. I mean, it's it's fascinating field of geology. 
I did a few field courses. I was still hooked. I still am. Um, but one of the things that started to become clear to me was that the only way I was going to be able to have a career in volcanology was if I went on and did a PhD. At least that's what I thought at the time. And I still wasn't sure that that was the right thing. So here I am working in this gold mine, and this is now in Alaska. And I'm thinking, you know what, this is so relevant. People need materials that come from the earth. So it doesn't matter if it's gold or if it's copper, if it's industrial minerals, this stuff has to be mined. And geologists around the world help with that. So I thought, I got to get into mining geology. I felt that it was a job security decision for the rest of my life because there's so much you can do that is tied to mining, even if you're not actively working in the mine. But I also started to realize that the people who I was looking up to in the industry had a little more education than I did. And so that's what made me decide to go on and do the master's. And I did the master's in economic geology. And then I worked again uh, for about two years <laughs> after that. And I guess something similar happened is that I was working with people who, I don't know, they seem to have like the more interesting work. And those were the people with PhDs or with just a lot of years of experience under their belts. There's more to the decision to going into the PhD for me. Um, should I talk about that now? Yeah, sure. Yes, Go for yeah. it. I mean, I have tons yeah. of questions, but yeah, let's let's this, finish. This off goes the, into the Scarn <laughs> topic. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so, well, uh, can I like can I just interrupt real quick then, Steph? And uh, okay, so you say that the people. I forget who phrased it, but the people who you kind of looked up to had more education than you. Do you think that was because of the degree or because of the skills they got during the degree? Like graduate school is not school. It's a very different thing than like normal school. It's not like certificate, at least how I view it, is not really like certification. It's you gain a lot of accessory skills. So, and I think for people, like I've often heard people say that the master's is kind of the working degree, like the ceiling is lifted. If you have a master's, there's kind of no ceiling on your career. Whereas with a, just a bachelor's, not just, but with a bachelor's, there might be some kind of moving up the ladder um, ceiling. So uh, can you disentangle like the degree versus the skills you get during the degree? Kind of, I don't know if that makes sense what I'm asking, but. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I certainly felt that way when I was uh, working at that gold mine and I had my bachelor's, I felt like there was a ceiling. I felt like it had to do with not having the masters. So I know for oil and gas, they pretty much, they won't generally employ you unless you have a master's. It's not quite the same story in mining. You can have a very long and fulfilling career with just a bachelor's degree, but it just, for me, it was more of like, I'm really curious about these things I'm looking at on a much deeper level. And I want to have, I want to be equipped with the skills to understand what I'm looking at and, and can add value to my company. So I think your question about, is it the skills or is it the degree? Yeah. And the reason I asked that, that uh, the, rare, the reason I asked that is like, okay, you were interested in volcanology, but you got an economic geology masters. So why it was just the degree. Maybe you would have gotten a volcanology degree and like gone and studied whatever you wanted to. And then go like, it, what's the difference there? And what was that decision like for you? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, because I will say now, if I had gone on to do a master's in volcanology, I would have still been employable in this field. Okay. So I think well, when it comes to the masters, good. yeah, yeah, especially with economic geology, for sure, because economic geology pulls from every aspect of geology. It helps if you understand ore systems and hydrothermal fluids, but you can learn a lot of that on the job. I think the most important part of doing a master's degree and re a research master's is the solving of the puzzle that is put in front of you or that you are putting together yourself. That's really, really important. Well, that's great. That, 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 that that's answer, probably that, the most important part. I think that answers the question for me. Steph, Thank I want to... Yeah, sorry, Chris. No, that's okay. Steph, so you said something really interesting that you could do what you do with a volcanology degree, right? Yes, okay. I think so. I mean, I know so. <laughs> I, I want to I talk about that. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting, especially to Jesse and I, because a lot of our listeners are are super interested in, you know, going into volcanology, but they're concerned about employability. And so is that not as big of an issue as what it's often made out to be? Look, I think it depends what they want to do. If they want to work as a volcanologist, I think that, that there is probably a reason to be concerned about employability. Um, look, I don't monitor the the job the jobs 
with a fine tooth comb these days, but in all of the years that I've been looking at jobs, industry jobs, I've only seen one volcanology job come available for a geologist. It was working for De Beers, and I thought that was really interesting, but they required the PhD. Wow, interesting. Okay. And okay. I thought, ooh, man, that's many, many years away. So I just thought, well, I'll pin that one for later. In fact, I do think I saved it um, <laughs> just because I thought it was so interesting. And I thought it was one of these rare things I'm never going to see again. But if you want to get into volcanology um, in a master's, I would say the best thing is to just be open-minded about what kind of work you want to do afterwards, because there can be a lot of related work that is very fascinating in the field of economic geology. Okay. Yes. That, that's interesting. And I think that's a, the reason we're asking these career things is not, you don't need to know the full employability index of the industry. And we're just, we were asking kind of similar questions to a bunch of different people. And actually a lot of people in the, we've interviewed people from oil and gas and environmental consulting kind of have the same answer. Like, it doesn't matter what you do it in, just do it. Then you'll get the skills to, to move on and, and see what you want to do next with the, the sort of research skills, as you mentioned. So we're getting some consistent answers here, Chris, it seems like, which is good because I think right. students try and over-optimize. They're like, oh, what should the title of my thesis be so that I can get the job I want? And it's like, well, you're overthinking it is kind of the advice. So it's good to hear. Yeah. The master's, I think, is really about, about learning how to do research, which is solving a puzzle. Solving problems. Yeah, right. Solving problems. Steph, yep. The people that you work with, Steph, do they have a like a diverse educational background then? Yes. So I, as I was talking about the, the uh, diamonds and the volcanology, I do work with a volcanologist, um, a person who has a PhD in volcanology. I work with, and he's working in, in this gold industry. I've also worked with a girl who had a master's in, I think it was palynology, so the study of, of pollen, fossilized pollen, you know, and there she is doing ore control and now I think doing resource geology. So this is all um, oh, wow. heavy into Very the economic cool. geology side of things. And I think what these people have in common is that they learned how to do the problem solving through their, their studies. And then You're they right. could transfer the skills. Jesse, you've said that. Yeah, yeah that's really, that's yeah, really interesting. That's interesting. So, okay, then fast forward. So you got your master's and then you went back to work for a little bit and then decided you want to get a PhD in SCARNs, which I'm excited, super excited to talk about SCARNs because they're like the totally craziest <laughs> rocks out there. What was that, that master's to work to PhD sort of decision tree like? Okay, so I have to just say my master's was on a SCARN. Oh, it was, was on a oh, SCARN. Okay. Yeah, my master's was on a SCARN in the Yukon. And while I was working on my master's on the academic side of it, so I did my field work on that SCARN in the Yukon, and then I went you know, to do the write-up and all this. Well, I had to work to pay my way through school, so I was working at a different SCARN in Alaska while I was writing up my master's on this SCARN in the Yukon. So I started to get a lot of SCARN exposure uh, like right out of the gate. And that's one of the many reasons why I just absolutely love SCARNs. But the SCARN in the Yukon was a funny one. It was a gold SCARN. It was not a very big SCARN. And uh, I think this is very typical of the industry where whichever type of deposit you're working on, the people there like to compare it to something significantly larger. <laughs> world class. It's exactly like the world <laughs> yes. class deposit, you know, in Mexico or something. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. It's a form of optimism, <laughs> um, you know, and that was that place was no different. So here I am working on this dinky little scarn in the Yukon and they're like, it's the next Antamina. And so Antamina, which is where I ended up doing my PhD, is actually the largest continuous scarn body in the world, which at the time, you know. Steph, can I interrupt yeah. you a second? Can you set the stage for us about what a scarn is? Yeah, we, ju we jumped and ahead then a little bit. let's get into, yeah, we <laughs> in need the to weeds. do that. Okay, yeah. all right, Wiggling sure. around in the weeds okay. here, a scarn, yeah. So a scar. Joyce is saying right now, my mom is saying, what is this thing you speak of? <laughs> yeah, we got to yeah. spell it. Right? <laughs> We're, jo and Joyce we mentioned lost. it. Joyce, the word is S-K-R-N, scarn. So it, you know, kind of like it. S-K-A-R-N. Uh, excuse me. Ah, S-K-A. Jesse, idiot. you spelled it wrong. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Joyce, Joyce, come on. It's S-K-A-R-N. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you didn't spell it with a C because I've seen that and I, I, it makes my skin crawl. But oh, anyway. Yeah, terrible. Um, yeah, S-K-A-R-N, SCARN. So the actual word SCARN is an old Swedish mining term that was, has been used to describe gang, gang mineralogy, the waste rock. Okay. Um, that is that's SCARN G -A -U altered. However, that's G-A-N-G-U-E. G-A-N-G-U-E, yes, that's right. Wow, my yeah, spelling we, we is don't... terrible today. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> we, uh, in the industry, we don't 
we don't use SCARN really to describe the waste rock now. Generally, when we're talking about SCARN, we're talking about something that is very flashy. So what a SCARN is, is it's a metasomatic, I know that's a big word, metasomatic replacement of typically uh, carbonate rocks, most typically carbonate rocks. And basically those carbonate rocks are most often marble, which I just said carbonate rocks, that's a metamorphic rock. So how SCARNs form, and this will explain metasomatism, is typically, I'll just say typically, because there's many ways that this could happen, but you'll have some carbonate stratigraphy, and it gets intruded by an intrusion, and you'll have a contact metamorphism take place around that intrusion, right? We're probably all familiar with that general process of contact metamorphism. So you'll expect some changes in the rock just based on the contact metamorphism. But if that intrusion has the right chemistry, for instance, if it contains enough uh, fluid that it releases, and with that fluid comes a lot of foreign ions that carry, get carried out into the country rock, you get addition of elements to this metamorphosed rock, and you get further changes. You get more dramatic changes. And that's the metasomatism. The metasomatism is like, you could think of it as like a way more advanced form of the contact metamorphism, It's but it requires addition of elements and removal to some extent, and a big change in the rock to the point where you can almost not recognize it as being a carbonate rock. So Steph, can I interrupt you? And then I want you to fill in the holes here then. So this is kind of like a, like a layer of limestone forming or a layer of limestone that has been formed. It gets intruded by an igneous intrusion and it, that contact metamorphism turns the limestone into marble. But then what turns it into a scarn from there? Then the next uh, step that turns it into a scarn is the hydrothermal fluids interacting with the marble. It's easiest to think of marble in an isochemical sense as if, you know, there's no chemical change happening. It's just, you know, you're getting recrystallization of the limestone. You could go from really fine grain limestone to coarse grain marble. That I think is the most useful because you're still starting with kind of a, a blank palette. But then when you introduce the hydrothermal fluids that are being driven off of this, this magma body, and those have all the goodies, everything that we're after, that will actually replace that marble. It'll dissolve it in places and it'll just replace it with all of the uh, the gang minerals that make up a scarn, which are typically calc silicates, calcium bearing silicate minerals, pyroxene and garnet primarily. And then you'll also get your metals if they're present. So scarn is always contact metamorphism? Like it's always related to an intrusion, a scarn deposit, like a economically viable scarn deposit, or not or always, some, not always, okay. but most okay. Uh, typically, and the largest scarns in the world are related to okay. intrusions. They're related to porphyry intrusions. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, so that brings us back to your. The, I think you said Antamina. You're about to talk about. I yes, think where you did your yes. PhD. Yeah, okay. we were, it, during my master's, we were comparing this little dinky scar to Antamina, <laughs> and I had to look up what the heck Antamina was. You know, at that time. Well, anyway, I I finished my master's. I went back into uh, work exploration. It was actually a really interesting job I had. It was, I was an exploration geologist now instead of a mine geologist, and I was enjoying it a lot better. And it was with a, a really uh, great company too. But this opportunity, I had expressed interest, I'll put it this way, I had just expressed interest to a professor who was looking at getting a project started on Antamina. And I thought, well, that's a wild shot in the dark, right? I said, well, I'll just let him know I'm interested. So when it became available, I applied and I told myself, if I get selected for this, I'm taking it because it's Antamina. And I will just quit my job. I will go back to being a student because there's never going to be an opportunity like this ever again to go from every other scarn in the world is going to be compared to Antamina. And then to get to actually study Antamina, well, that's what happened. I got selected. And I oh, remember so that cool. moment because I thought, oh God, I'm letting go of this job security. And, you know, I like this <laughs> job and here I am going back to be a student, but it was worth it. Okay. Steph, can you tell our listeners what is so special about Antamina? Because I think a lot of them may not have heard about this. Yeah. Okay. So and what and what is it mined? It's mined, presumably. What is it mined for? Like what elements? What's the commodity that of interest in scar? It's mainly copper and secondarily, I'll say zinc. Okay. Yeah. And there's a bunch of other gotcha. interesting metals that occur there too. Molybdenum, galena. Okay. And so you the 
the results of your PhD. I mean, how cool was it? What was like the, the elevator pitch summary of your PhD? I've summarized it as big plate, move bad, make good rock. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so great. <laughs> Antamina is in the Peruvian Andes. So what's happening in that part of the world is we've got subduction of the Nazca plate. So there's your big plate and it's colliding with the South American plate. So there's your big plate move bad part. And what happens in that process is sometimes you can actually make some really nice rocks, which, well, let's face it, most of the Andes has very nice rocks in terms of copper endowment. And Antamina is no exception. The thing that makes Antamina different, though, from all of those other, and they truly are world-class deposits in that part of the world, Antamina is different because of the host rocks. And the host rocks at Antamina are carbonates along the length of that chain. There are some other scarns and some other carbonate bodies, but none as extensive as Antamina, which has a mineralized depth of about two kilometers. It actually exceeds two kilometers. Just think about that. Two kilometers of continuous mineralization at from surface to depth, and it was open at depth, meaning that the mineralization continued beyond the length of drilling. This is beyond the scope of contact metamorphism then, right? Way beyond, beyond the scope of it. Yes. This is a yes. very active system. And in terms of Antamina, so the, the next part of, I guess, the more detailed part of the elevator pitch is that there are at least 13 fertile porphyries that intruded kind of in a very close space, basically along a structural corridor. So they were confined as to where they could occur, and that basically created a coalesced body of scarn around this intrusive complex. It's uh, like two, almost three kilometers long, kilometer and a half wide at least, and then at least two kilometers deep, and keeps That's going. That's amazing. So it's Just, huge. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. And very concentrated, yeah. I assume, right? Very concentrated. I mean, just absolutely gorgeous rocks. Like Jesse said, very complicated looking. I, mean, I hear this a lot. People get really freaked out by scarns, but I love them. They're just, they're absolutely beautiful. Now, they there is a porphyry. There's many porphyries actually in the core of Antamina, and those are interesting too. But porphyries tend to be lower grade in terms of a mining way we would look at it is like a low grade, high tonnage. And the okay. scarns so, tend to be high grade, low tonnage, but at Antamina, that's not true. They are high grade, high tonnage. Wow. Well, okay. Can right. Steph, can we differentiate between the porphyry and the scarn then? So the porphyry is, it's an igneous rock, right? So that's not where you're finding all this mineralization. Is that correct? Well, I'll speak about Antamina in this example. But yes, in Antamina, there is mineralization in the porphyries. It's just not as high grade as it is in the scarn. And that has so much okay. to do with the reactivity of the carbonate wall rocks. Generally, the magmatic hydrothermal fluids are a little more acidic. And then when you react that, Geology 101, with your carbonate wall rocks, you get massive changes in the chemistry, just disequilibrium and metals are dropping out right there. So cool. Right. So That's Chris and so I visited uh, okay. once in, uh, in, in uh, oh, Vermont or Maine, Chris? Was it Maine? Or Vermont? It was Maine. It was in it was Maine. Maine. Okay. Well, yeah. So my memory, my spelling's bad. My memory sucks. Um, but we visited, <laughs> uh, we got grossular garnet. We were looking for grossular garnet in, you know, these, these like uh, cavities at this kind of scarn deposit. And I remember Chris almost died. I think we were, it was like this, you know, it was one of these mineral collecting hot spots was like in some national forest and like way back in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and I, I was with my buddy andrew and we were walking in the woods and all of a sudden we realized we're we're like i don't know where chris is we get to the edge and we look down and there's a pit beneath us and we're like chris where are you at and he's actually underneath and we read what we were walking on was this like slab of rock that was overhanging and chris had walked underneath of this thing and i don't remember i think chris we walked down next to you and we're like holy crap that thing is super unstable and we actually collapsed part of it because we thought it was so dangerous we were shocked it hadn't collapsed before so we like i'm getting this wrong probably but you are okay. getting this wrong yeah, right. yeah. that's my yeah. memory it of it was, and so that it was that a is complete mistake <laughs> yes i almost did die because i was with two idiots that walked out onto this onto the top of this thing and then andrew uh jumped up i don't know why because he's just excitable and it collapsed, it collapsed. i mean so and we were, we were yeah. like wow that was that was good that it, it but this leads me to a question because we were looking at these cavities with like beautiful grossular crystals in them and my memory the metamorphic you know reactions as you go from like 
carbonate to marble and then up to these sort of decarbonization reactions, you like lose a lot of mass. You lose rock mass at higher grades. So does a SCARN deposit, an economic SCARN deposit have to be pretty high temperature to form? Like, do you have to lose the initial limestone, like the carbonate mass to put these other elements that you're speaking of in during metasomatism or not? Yes. It, it, you do. Okay. All right. So they have to be like 500 degrees C or 400 At degrees C or something? Yes. At least. Wow. Yes. That's amazingly so, well, hot. This actually, yes. This gets into some SCARN terminology that we refer to as prograde and retrograde. We probably, you probably do that in metamorphic world too. But prograde SCARNs are the high temperature event that forms the anhydrous minerals, the garnets and the clinopyric scenes generally. And those could be higher than 500 degrees C. And then what ends up happening generally is the system starts to cool and the fluid circulating will start to deposit what we call the retrograde phases as the system is cooling down. And so those are much lower temperature um, hydrous phases. That's where you'll start to get your amphiboles and possibly some calcite. And that's typically where your metals come in. Uh, this sort of you've you've set the stage at the high temperatures, and then as the system's cooling down, the the metals are deposited. Okay, I mean that's super interesting. I feel like we could talk about scarns for a long time. They're just like totally crazy uh, environments. But if we come back, focusing on your career sort of trajectory a little bit, so you started out interestingly as a mine geologist, or you 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 worked your way up to a mine geologist, then went and got your master's exploration geologist. Then PhD, super expert in the like world's biggest scarn deposit. And I guess maybe you could explain just really briefly the difference in those job descriptions. I don't know. It just, it seemed like you weren't super taken by being a mine geologist and why, and what is the difference there? Gosh, this is going to, this is going to be a bit of a thought. Well, here. <laughs> that was a long, <laughs> if you need Jesse to break that up, that was like a five minute question. I, I guess yeah, I yeah, don't want to be, um, <laughs> All of those jobs are important, and you're right. It just it just comes down to what you're most taken with, I guess. And so I was a mine geologist in the position that I described at that. It was an open pit gold mine in Alaska. And you know what? I actually did enjoy it. I really did enjoy that. But I also felt like that at that time of my life, there was more. Can I interrupt real quick and ask what, can you just describe quickly what a mine geologist does on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I guess it sort of depends um, because you could be a mine geologist in an open pit mine or an underground mine, but there's some some similarities in terms of what the general job description would be. And as that is you are uh, basically keeping up with production in the sense that when drilling takes place, we collect samples and then they get assayed for, in this example, gold. Once those assays come back, There'll be a type of mine geologist, generally called an ore control geologist, who will receive the assays and kind of map out where the high grades are and decide sort of how the material is going to get divided and where it's going to get sent. So that person may spend all of their time doing that specific job is just sort of mapping out material across a mine, depending on production needs. But then you may have somebody who actually goes in the field and makes sure that that material ends up where it's supposed to go. So that could involve doing some visual or control like on the ground. Sometimes when I was doing that job, I would sit in the shovel and I would actually direct scoop by really? scoop. Where does the material go? No yep. kidding. So it sort wow. of depends. Yeah. That's and that's, that's fun. Um, that's not typical, but that's fun. Or, you know, you're going to go check on drill rigs. You're going to go see, you know, what's coming out of the next round of drilling. There'll be some mapping involved. There's almost always mapping involved. And so, yeah, whether or not you're underground or in an open pit, you'll be involved in mapping as soon as new ground becomes available. And so that's what I mean by keeping up with production. So they'll blast an area, they'll remove the rock, and then you've got to go in there and it's a whole new part of the earth that's never been exposed before. So you'll get in there and map it. You usually have to do it pretty quickly because they're going to blast again. Being a mine geologist is a very fast paced job that involves all aspects of, you know, what type of material is this? Where is it going? And also just keeping up with uh, mapping and staying like in line with the drilling and with the blasting that's taking place. Got it. Not hindering those processes. That, I mean, it sounds fascinating. It could be, it could, sounds like it could potentially be fascinating or 
rather tedious depending on yes, <laughs> what it is. It's both. <laughs> so exploration geologist, what is that and what attracted you to that or what attracts you to that side more or did at, at that stage of your life, maybe after a master's? So exploration actually has to take place before mining can take place. And exploration has a couple of different uh, divisions as well that we'll just generally refer to it. There's greenfields, which is the very early stage exploration. And then there's brownfields, which if there's, say there's an operating mine, you'll have a, a production group in that mine, but you will also have a group of geologists that are looking at expanding the footprint of the mine or finding nearby deposits, expanding the resource. And so they're not typically involved in the day-to-day production needs, but they are doing what we call brownfield exploration, which is near to an existing mine. There's that group of exploration, then there's the greenfields. The greenfields is where you're generally the first boots on the ground in an area that you wonder if there's ever been a human there before. And uh, you might be just prospecting, like to some extent, collecting samples, mapping if there's enough outcrop. You may be doing soil samples at this early stage, also stream sediment samples with the aid of remote sensing, like whatever you can use to help vector you into an area that is most prospective for further exploration. And so just pure sort of discovery at that stage. You're just like, you know, I, I could see why it's excitement, that a little higher excitement potentially. Yeah, it, it's, it is exciting. You know, you're covering a lot of ground um, as a Greenfields exploration geologist because you're kind of just grabbing a lot of samples and moving to the next spot. Every day you're in a okay. different location. Interesting. Uh, and, that, and that is where you are now? Now I'm an exploration geologist. My official title is a project geologist, but I'm an exploration geologist. Sorry, I should say I work in a project that is in an exploration stage. So we okay. are... Uh, so can we talk about that? Yeah. Or, so what are you doing right now? Where are you working? Can you tell us a little bit about what your day-to-day looks like as an exploration geologist? Yeah. Okay. So I'm a little higher up the the food chain, I guess, <laughs> in, in terms of exploration geology by now. So I spend my time doing a lot of modeling. I do spend a lot of time sitting in front of a computer, whether the field season is on or off. And so my project is in Alaska the Donlin Gold Project. And that project is an advanced stage of exploration. So we've got uh, many drill holes. We have a lot of data to support a resource that has been calculated for a pretty big footprint. And my job is to mostly deal with the data. So when you say modeling stuff, what data are you using and, and what are you modeling? Are you like trying to model out the deposit and refine like what we think it, three dimensions is in the earth? And, and how are you doing that? Like, can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, so uh, mostly the data is gold values, gold assays that came from drill core samples, and also uh, the core logging information that we get from those same drill core samples. So uh, when the core is drilled, the geologists, the other exploration geologists who mostly spend time on site will be the first to see that rock, and then they will log it for its many properties. Lithology, they'll look at geotechnical aspects of it. They'll look at the physical mineralization and record a bunch of information about these rocks, I will receive that information and I will build a model that reflects the observations from the field. So I'll be putting together shapes of intrusions, looking for continuity of intrusions. And then they'll sample those very same rocks. And then within about a month or so, we'll get the results from those assays. And then I'll be able to put those gold values into that model and see uh, what's controlling the gold distribution. And that helps us plan for more drill targets and really just understand what's controlling the gold in this deposit. How deep do these cores go? How, how, how deep are you capable of going? And is that an expensive process? It's an expensive process, yes. Um, yes. How deep? Yes. Well, um, like at Antamina, we had our deepest drill holes were 2,000 meters. Whoa. Wow. Two kilometers. Okay. And that's how I know that the, the deposit continued because those were our deepest drill holes and they kept going. The deposit kept going. Yeah, so at Donlin, we don't drill quite as deep, but it just depends on the deposit, you know, because um, every deposit has a different shape. So some are like kind of more tabular um, and they have like, they're shallow, but they have long lateral extents. Some are quite deep, you know, like uh, another deposit I worked on was veins and some of those veins were dipping quite steeply. And so the drilling would basically drill until you cross the vein and then that's it. So where you currently are, how many core sa- or how many cores have you drilled or are you going to drill? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to guess like 3000. 
Uh, that's a guess. Wow. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. That's so actually. This is. Yeah, it's a lot. That's, this is kind of high pressure, then, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's not cheap. No, it's to not drill cheap. This. But look, this has been going on now for at Donlin. Um, I should say since the '80s. Okay, then can we maybe ask a broader question then? That like, how long can a job like this last? Like, you know, whether it's Anamina or you know something else, right? Like how. Doing an exploration geologist job, how long can you expect to stay at that one spot? Ooh. Well, yeah, that's an interesting point. If you're looking for job security, it's probably not in exploration, not as much as it is in mining. You know, like if you uh, get in when a mine starts, you could probably stay there for the life of the mine, which could be, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. You could have an entire career at one spot. You may probably change your job role over that period of time, but you could stay in one location. But as an exploration geologist, generally, you're going to be moving around a lot. You might see a, a project through to uh, a certain stage, and then you move on to the next project and do the same thing. So I want to ask a couple questions about that stuff, because I think this is there's a bunch of people, I mean, my students in my research group would find this information valuable, and I'd imagine a bunch of our listeners would too. That seems stressful. So on like a personal level for you, if you're willing, can you... Talk about how you view that. Like it, you've moved around a lot in your career, different companies, different deposits. Is that always stressful? Is that getting less stressful? Are you kind of always moving up? I mean, you must be because you're, as you said, sort of at the at the top of the, the feeding tower now. And then the other question is like, has that, okay, I'll stop there and then I'll come back and ask my other question, I suppose. <laughs> if you're willing to give us like some personal if there's tension in there for you, or if you just really love that part of it, I don't know. Uh, personally, I, I find it exciting. You know, it is stressful though. But it's a choice. It's a choice to be in exploration. So prior to this job that I currently have now, which is in exploration, I worked in mining, which I could have stayed in that place if I wanted to. But exploration is more exciting, I would say, for me. And I thought this was a good opportunity. And I don't know how long it would last. You never do. But yeah, I think if you can, if you can accept that it's going to change and just it forces you to be very responsible. I would say, with uh, some of the decisions you make in your life. So I don't mind that. So uh, can I maybe, and, and maybe this is too personal a question, but you know, jobs that are more risky and less security, often you get compensated for that. And maybe it's compensated by it's just a more exciting job. In these boom and bust cycles, you get rewarded during the boom times for the fact that there's a bust coming. Is the compensation different between exploration and mining geologists, given the stability? And this is I would think in general, that's true. I, I would think in general, that's true. However, from my own experience, I can't say for sure, because all I can say is that my compensation has increased with my experience. Uh, I haven't really had a lot of back and forth, even though I've worked mining, exploration, mining, exploration, mining, exploration. Every time I change jobs, I generally got a higher compensation. There was only one time and I can remember when that didn't happen, but it was very short lived. So that's interesting. So it is, it is beneficial to work on a bunch of different deposits and therefore a bunch of different companies in, instead of move around a bunch and gain this breadth of knowledge. If, if you're going to want a career in economic geology, I think it's important to work as many aspects of this industry as possible. So try open pit underground, be a mine geologist for a while. You have to understand that part of the job. Do exploration. Do every stage of exploration. You know, jump out of helicopters in the middle of nowhere. Fight off bears. <laughs> um, you know, like <laughs> it, sit by a drill rig, whether it's um, a core rig or RC. And then one of the other things I did recently was work in resource geology too. And so that's more on like the, the back end, the numbers side of things, calculating how much gold using statistics and, and locating it and all of that. So getting a, a taste of all of it really makes you a much more well-rounded geologist. And then, you know, these are the kinds of people that become the the leaders later on in their career once you've got all this experience. I mean, that is great advice, it sounds like, for people, you know, thinking about, about going down a path like this. So on that note, given this critical minerals wave, so this like big wave of critical minerals, lots of, seems like new exploration, people looking for lithium pegmatites for the first time in generations. How does that feel from your seat? Does it feel like there's more yeah, opportunities? Yeah, I guess that's one way of looking at it. Uh, so I work in gold, and gold isn't a critical mineral. <laughs> so most of my career has actually been working in minerals that are not deemed critical. But what's interesting is gold, while it typically is uncombined in nature, it's it's native gold, it generally occurs with other accessory minerals. 
For instance, where I work now, we have a lot of arsenic and we have antimony. Both of those are on the current critical minerals list. So it does force you to take a different look at what would otherwise be considered maybe deleterious elements or waste rock. So this is what I find is interesting about this is that it, it's going to get people to look at maybe their tailings ponds and see what can we extract out of there that we weren't paying attention to before. Or maybe our deposit has more value than just the main mineral of interest, and especially when you're dealing with something like gold, which, like I said, isn't a, considered a critical mineral. Yeah, okay. we're interesting. We're doing, oh, we're really seeing a lot of that in the UP, Jesse, uh, in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, with these old tailings piles. Now they're reopening those abandoned mines and taking a second look at that stuff. So that's interesting. Steph, can I ask you a philosophical question? Look, this is dangerous stuff because yeah. when Chris pulls these, we just never know where it's going to go. Right. When he goes, well, I have a random thought. <laughs> I do. This They're is like, oh my god, this could be. I should have put this on anywhere. the question list, but I didn't. I don't know why. But look, every person that goes into geology, we go into it because, in part, we love where we live. You know, we want to take care of our planet. You know, we want to know as much about it as we can. But yet, mining is a dirty business. Uh, so. Can you talk about that maybe like is have you ever had or felt conflicted with this? I haven't. Maybe that makes me evil. I no, haven't. I want to know about this. That is, is so interesting. Okay. I I haven't felt conflicted. I feel like I recognize what you're saying though. And if um you want to be a part of making something better, you have to actually like jump in and be a part of it. And I think that what I do is just that. It's been very interesting from my perspective as a geologist, though, to see what happens on the environmental side of mining. I have a few examples here. So a lot of times these big companies, when they take over an area for a, what will be a, a large deposit, there's been a history there of artisanal mining. So small scale mining that tends to be more destructive, environmentally speaking, than the large, the large deposits. So the agreements that are made um, with these big companies is that you need to clean up this mess that was left here in addition to reclaiming the mine that you're about to build. And I've, I've seen the after effects of that. Like I wouldn't have believed it if I was just told this. Yeah, right. Like, you know, I've driven down a road next to a stream that looked completely pristine. And then I was shown pictures of that very same place later, you know, from a hundred years ago and what it looked like. It was unrecognizable. And this is all due to the reclamation efforts of, of one company. I've seen this happen, though, in a number of places. So I, I have faith that the environmental side, the environmental uh, groups that work for these mining companies, sorry, they have environmental departments, I should say. So those people, they are doing a great job of making sure that we minimize our footprint while still extracting the resources that society needs. So there's that. But then the other thing, too, is at least in uh, the States, Canada, I'm thinking of places where I've actually, been, like Australia, Chile, like a number of places where mining takes place. These places have regulations to protect the environment that basically it's going to cost companies more to do the job wrong than it will to do the job right. I think that's very true of where we live. Now, I think it's not true everywhere in the world. So this is also um, part of this big problem of not every place in the world has the same level of regulation. And not all regulation is great, but it does certainly prevent a lot of these big environmental, big environmental damage that we all don't want in our backyard, right? See, I, that's really interesting stuff because I, I think I, I've sort of paid attention to the, the sort of pegmatite mining debate up in New England area. So, you know, Maine and Vermont, New Hampshire. And it seems like there's a lot of local hesitancy about mining because the mining that is in their heads is like 1920s, 1900s, 1890s style mining. Same up in the Northwest Territories, up in remote northern Canada. The gold mining up there was 1920s, 30s. Not great. They didn't handle the arsenic very well. Uh, big catastrophic environmental potential disaster hanging out up there. You're saying it's different now. And I, I sort of would like to believe that, but I think that's an important like d distinction to make that like not mining is not one thing. There's like a whole bunch of different nuances to mining and it can be done really well. And, and remediation can be done amazingly well. And some places it's not. So ha have you ever not worked on a project 
for reasons like this, I suppose. Have you have you like intentionally stuck to working in areas where you are happy with this the sort of mining regulations? Yeah, that that hasn't actually come up for me. I'm sure it yeah, it hasn't come up for me at all. Uh, generally the places where I've worked have had good records. Sure. I mean the places you listed are the, the good I mean you're not Well, for the record it does not make you an evil person. Your answer it was actually like I appreciate it. I really wanted to hear that and like Jesse said I I believe you. I mean it's that's I have to say I don't a, struggle yeah. with this at all because and and I'm pretty green, I'll say. I've been accused of being a little earthy, a little bit of a hippie. But you know, <laughs> we like all have I was, a little bit of that in us. Yeah. yeah. That's it's, perfect. It's good. Chris is too. Chris is just talking about braiding his beard. We, his we, we love so, the know, environment, right? We right. love the, the natural <laughs> world, which is a lot of the reason why we all became geologists. And we also love our iPhones and we love our cars. And yes. and you know, I've been I was a bicycle commuter for many years, but guess what? My bicycle is a product of mining, you know, like Every single thing. I sometimes think, like, what in my life is not a product of mining? No, everything in my life is a product of mining. Even when we come down to, there's kind of the miner's credo, if it can't be grown, it must be mined. Have you guys heard that? Well, even the things that we grow are a product of mining to some extent. When you consider fertilizer, when you consider the metal that is used for irrigation systems and just for planting and harvesting crops. I mean, it is really difficult to come up with a way to live without mining. And so for that reason, I have to accept that it's an, it's something that's necessary. I do think we just need to manage it as best we can because nobody wants to clean up a giant mess and look sure. at a giant mess. Yeah. We all still want to get out and enjoy nature. Absolutely. Yeah. A amen Love to it. that. I, I, I completely agree. I mean, you're partially preaching to the choir, but yes, I completely agree. And there, like you said, that we have to have some nuance in this discussion of, you know, sustainability and environmental sustainability and the, the green energy transition and all this stuff. But we have to have some nuance into like how we uh, uh, tackle it. And mining is certainly one part of the answer. So uh, Steph, I thank you so much for your time. I want to ask one question. Our, our traditional closing question here is what has been your best day as a geoscientist? Oh man, I think it's it's got to be back in 2006 when I first experienced lava, flowing lava. That was in Hawaii, <laughs> <laughs> right? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Every <laughs> geologist, right? <laughs> Um, it was right. in Hawaii. That's right. That was an eruption of Kilauea uh, from the Pu'u'u'u vent, which was erupting at that time. I was in Hawaii. I was uh, planning to go into volcanology studies, and so I was taking a field course there. And part of it was physical physical volcanology when we went out on the active flows and observed all of that and took samples, and it was great. So it was probably my experience with that's, lava. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> what is the coolest rock you've seen? Is it from the, the giant scar in mine? I mean, some of these rocks must be- Yeah, good. it's from Antimina. What is it? What, and what is in it? What, what does it look like? <laughs> oh, man. Well, bornite and chalcopyrite primarily are the ore minerals, and we're looking at just massive amounts of garnet. But scarns are, are absolutely beautiful. I mean, the garnets are generally well-formed, and- they're just museum quality specimens. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. So pretty. Amazing. Well, Steph, thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, I, I, very informative. I've learned a ton and I, I sort of love, love your perspective yeah, me too. on mining and geology and education. It's been uh, really informative. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us here. Yeah. Really thank you. It. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's been great. Hey, that's a wrap. As always, you can follow us. Go to our website, planetgeocast.com. There you can like, subscribe. You can support us. We really appreciate that when people go there and support us. You can also find more of our content on our new mobile app. You can find it in the iOS and Android app store. Just search for Camp Geo. You'll see our little symbol there. You can download that. There you can find Camp Geo, our conversational textbook, audiobook for the geosciences. And uh, you can download content now there and look at images and, and learn via audio discussions with us. And also you can purchase access to our Yellowstone geology guide and more stuff coming at you pretty soon on that platform. So go there, download the Camp Geo app and head to our website. As always, send us an email, planetgeocast at gmail.com. Hit us up with any questions. We love getting those. Cheers. Peace.